My lovely, lovely imps, the time has come at long last for me to tell you my full feelings about Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This game has taken the gaming world by storm. Gamers have been losing their minds, filling their diapers, filling their underpants with other materials of all types um, over Tears of the Kingdom. And to be honest, I also have been, have very much enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom and also was very excited for Tears of the Kingdom. However, my lovely imps, I come to you today with critiques. And there are a lot of people on the internet who have been very defensive about Tears of the Kingdom. And I think that it's important to check those people just a tiny bit. Not because I like to rain on people's parade, but because I think that if you give unalloyed praise to games that do not deserve unalloyed praise, you won't have an accurate memory of the game and you just forever uh, continue to cycle a a, a never-ending uh, regurgitation of nostalgia, basically. This game is good because it reminds me of something else. This game is good because it's a series that I love. I think it is important to critique the things that you love. And today, I am going to be critiquing a game that I loved. So, first off, I really, really liked uh, Tears of the Kingdom. I have not beaten the game as in I haven't finished the very tail end of the game and actually that's part of the that's going to be part of the critique that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit um uh, uh I I didn't finish the final part of the game so you don't have to worry about that type of spoilers I'm going to do my best to avoid spoilers but I can't make any promises there are some things about the story that I have to discuss so if you really care about spoilers in this game um I guess check out the review once you're done. I'm going to post on the channel shortly. Um, but otherwise, I encourage you to stick around and hear what I have to say. Because I have a lot to talk about. And most of it is going to be focusing uh, on non-spoiler related things. I have played, I, I don't even know, 60, 70 plus hours of uh, Tears of the Kingdom. I have also watched two, uh, well... All of my other partners play this game. I've talked about it with m all of my friends. Basically, everyone I know has been playing Tears of the Kingdom, and I've been enjoying it quite a lot. Um, Tears of the Kingdom uh, is is obviously... It takes place in like the same exact world map with a few little modifications as Breath of the Wild, the previous game. And we're gonna dive into all of this stuff in a second, but I just wanted to say I had a really good time with it and I do not regret my purchase, even though it's a $70 game, which is a lot of money. Um, Nintendo games are expensive, guys. They're just really, really expensive. I have no regrets regardless, even with it being a $70 game. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of things that I truly, truly love about this game, and I'm going to start with the good things first, okay? Which is, uh, the one thing that I love the most is that this game is very, very, very horny, okay? I mean, just unabashedly very horny. Now, the Legend of Zelda games have always been very horny. Um, all, all of them. Um, all of time. It is a, it is a ancient Legend of Zelda tradition um, that these games are very, very confident in their, uh, in their, and, and I'm not saying that they're like adults only games. They just have, they're very confident in their sexiness. The characters are sexy. They're creative. There is a lot of different types of references, like loose references to kinks and things like that, that people are into. They're just very confident games in that way. It's something I've always liked about the Legend of Zelda series, that they're not afraid to have uh, certain levels of uh, sexual expression, that Link is explicitly a uh, a, a, a gender non-conforming character. The, de develop, the, the designer of Link explicitly talked about how he wanted 
uh, he wanted female players to see masculine traits and identify with them in Link. He wanted masculine players to see feminine traits in Link and be able to identify with them. And he wanted people to be, he wanted people of all sexes and genders to be attracted to Link in their own way, which is really cool. And you see this actually through most of the games. Uh, in Ocarina of Time, for example, I mean, one of the main characters that all of the, all of the you know, straight guys are super into, you know, Princess uh, Princess Zelda when she's an adult, hopefully. Um, you know, they're into the Princess Zelda. She's super pretty. But then you also find out, spoiler alert for Ocarina of Time, uh, that Sheik, who is very, very masculine and a, and a warrior and dresses up like a boy, is actually also Princess Zelda, that they're the same person in disguise. That Princess Zelda is both a beautiful princess and a sort of masculine fighter warrior type. Um, so this is a thing that's been in the ca in the games all along and something that I deeply appreciate. Um, I've always appreciated the games that are, are confident in their, in their sexy, in their sexuality. Um, and also that they're confident in their representations of varying gender expressions. Now, um, there is one thing that I have to criticize, uh, uh, the entire series, but especially Tears of the Kingdom on. Okay, this is, the, this is what we like to call the queer analysis portion of this review, which is, unfortunately, it's basically always just implied. Everything. Uh, any sort of transness, any sort of gender variance, any sort of sexuality um, of any type, except for heterosexuality, which is explicit. All forms of... of uh, non-typical sexuality are totally and utterly uh, left into the realm of speculation. And that is unfortunate. Because for a game that is otherwise so confident in its visual portrayals of sexuality, it's unfortunate to know that they don't have the confidence to have a character actually be gay. That they don't have the confidence to have a character explicitly talk in any way or even reference in any way gender variants um even characters like i mean uh there's there's characters that are so obviously supposed to be gay characters side on guys okay in this game it, I love the, on one hand, I really, really love that they basically make giant jokes that when you go to the Zora domain in this game, minor spoiler warning, when you go to the Zora domain in, in Tears of the Kingdom, you, you, the first thing you see is a giant statue of Link, of, of feminine little Link hanging off this giant muscular frame of Prince Sidon. Literally, there's a statue in the middle of town of Sidon and his, in the words of the characters, very best friend with his arms wrapped around his muscular neck. Okay? It is extremely cute and funny. However, as much as I love that, given that the rest of the entire game is completely and utterly absent of any gay characters explicitly in any way, it comes off as a form of cowardice that I think does the series a disservice. Like, um, like, that sucks, right? Like, it's cool and funny if you want to have heavy implications and jokes in one area, but you see men and women married all over the place. There are references to wives. There are res references to women who say, my husband, I miss my husband. The entire culture of the Gerudo is explicitly, all they talk about is themselves going out to find husbands in the world. And nowhere is there a character who's a gay guy looking for a husband or a gay woman looking for a wife at all, anywhere to be found. Isn't that kind of weird and it kind of sucks, doesn't it? That like you can that you can go straight up to the line and have this huge tongue in cheek um uh moments uh or or like 
you know, you can have all this t tongue in cheek jokes that go all the way up to being like Prince Sidon. Okay, guys, there, I took a screenshot in in the Zora's area. There's a part where Prince Sidon's wife literally says, "Link, I need you desperately to go on it to go on an adventure with Prince Sidon because he's been depressed and he's not the same when he doesn't get to go on adventures with you. Please, he's not himself. He's depressed and sad. Go on an adventure with him so that he'll get his mojo back and it'll fix our marriage." Just literally, like, how much more he needs, to, he needs to fuck a twink or he's going to lose his mind and he won't, and he's not having a good time anymore. It's like, come on, it's Jesus Christ. It's like, that's how much, it's so obvious that that's what they're pointing at. And like, um, and, and it, and it sucks that like, you can have hundreds of characters in the game uh, who are heterosexual, referencing their wife, referencing their marriage. I love my wife. I love my husband, all this stuff. But you never get to explicitly acknowledge any gay characters at all. There's none, to my knowledge. Maybe there might be some buried reference somewhere. Now, there's another character in the game who I really, really like, um, who is... Uh, a carpenter, uh, I think his name is Benson, right? Benson? I might be getting the name slightly wrong. What's his name? Somebody will, somebody will correct me. Bolson, Bolson. Why do I think Benson? Bolson. Um, Bolson is a extremely flamboyant guy. He literally has, uh, like, makeup on, wears a little, a little, uh, 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 animal print, boa thing and he walks around and goes oh you're so cute and he goes "Ooh!" his little noise is all these hyper feminine i love him i absolutely love the bolson character bolson is very clearly supposed to be sort of a stereotypical gay guy and he's not portrayed hatefully he's like extremely flamboyant but he's like a, a lovable a really lovable character and he has one of the best storylines in the game in my opinion um, which I'm going to come back to Bolson's storyline uh, a bit later when we're talking about mechanical stuff once we're out of the queer analysis portion. Um, we love, I love Bolson. But guess what? They never acknowledge that he's gay. At all. Ever. They just never say, he, they will not actually say the word that he's gay. He rep he's queer in his in all of his portrayal down to the way that he flirts with Link, but they will never just acknowledge that he's gay. They won't show him with a husband. They won't show him with anything like that. And it's one of the things that actually just one of the things that bums me out about this game is that uh, after all these years, there's so much there's so much confidence otherwise in sexuality in 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 the sexiness of the characters and in this game the characters are so sexy the designs are so off the rails especially with the male characters they went so hard with so many of the male characters in this game uh raru is like one of the main characters of the game and he's just this unbelievably sexy um, totally atypical masculine character. He's a very masculine character, but he has a, um, but he has atypical features. He's thin and, and muscular, not like huge and, o and over ripped like you usually get. He's not a power fantasy type character. Um, he's a twink, but he's like a confident, uh, hunter twink. Um, and all of this, um, and yet, and yet, nothing no actual acknowledgement they're still too afraid to acknowledge that gay people exist that gay people are okay and uh and it's not even a it, and 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 there's a bunch of stupid completely stupid idiots out there who are like well it's supposed to be in medieval times no it's fucking not it's in hyrule in hyrule they have magical robot technology and they live in castles with magic swords. No, it's not medieval times. There's nothing about that. It's a completely different world. They just don't do it. They just refuse to. And it it's unfortunate. And I and it makes me sad. It makes me sad that the best that we can get is heavy winks and nods, but at the end of the day, it is still 
too far for them to just acknowledge that gay people exist. It is something that that bums me out. And it was it was unfortunate because I kept expecting um I, I kept expecting uh them to just finally do it. I expected them to have, you know, Bolson have a husband or have a a uh, a lesbian Gerudo person or something like that. I expected them to just put one in there somewhere, but they didn't. Um and it's it's sad. It's it's unfortunate. Um it's what Nintendo always seems to do. Yeah, it, it is true that that's what Nintendo always seems to do. And it's fucked. It's bad. It, it takes away from their games. And it takes away from the message of their games. And it makes me sad for the people that make them. Because, um... Because, um... Because, uh, uh, um... It's very clear that whoever made this is obviously not straight. Like, it's so obvious to me that the people working on this game are not straight. They're not, they might be bisexual, they might be pansexual, but they're not straight, okay? Um, and yet, there's just this painful silence. And it bums me out on a, on a, a on a, on a, on a level that I can't fully express. Isn't Japan like way more socially conservative even on the surface? Not all of Japan, but Nintendo absolutely is. Nintendo is a derangedly conservative company and it really, really sucks. It sucks. And I am going to criticize the game on that front because it should be better. And I'm, I'm, I'm a fucking, that's what I talk about, okay? I'm a, I'm a queer streamer. I talk about queer issues. I talk about LGBTQ Q issues all the time. So of course I'm going to talk about that. But, um, and it just, it just limits the system. It limits the entire story to this, uh, to everything just having to be ultimately at the end a joke when you could have beautiful characters and there's all, and let me just tell you real quick, one other thing. Let me just be clear. The gay people love Legend of Zelda. You have no idea. The entire Link side on thing was the only reason it is even further pandered to in this game is because of how religiously gay people latched on to Link and side on. How religiously uh, oh my god, there's so many examples of this. It, it's never ending. You should see the art that's made. The fan art will show you just how much uh, gay people resonate with the Legend of Zelda. And every single gay person I know in the entire world was playing this stupid game. So it's it's unfortunate that um, it's unfortunate that that there that that boldness is tempered even to this day, because for the rest of it, let me like again. The characters are off the rails. The body types are all over the place. This game doesn't hold back at all with body types. Tall. You got the tallest, super tall, super ripped characters. You've got the crazy muscle gods like Ganondorf. You've got a demon form Ganondorf where he's literally just made out of muscles. You've got the, the uh, confident and strong but lithe uh, twink types with Raru. You've got these uh, ephemeral elf-like with Mineru, uh, the femi super feminine but very like otherworldly and elven with Mineru. You've got the sort of... Uh, traditional girl next door with princess zelda you've got of course link with his gender ambiguity and how cute he is when he's cold and all of that stuff and and um it's just uh there's so much oh my god you've got the you've got a uh, pen who's the uh who's the 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 new bird who's got like he's like very top heavy and he's a he's a, a a boisterous and loud and confident bird guy who loves working with his teammate and he's always super supportive and all this shit you've got the gorons every single one of the gorons have like the they're they've got like the bara uh, sumo wrestler builds there's so much diversity of body types in men and women in these games and it's awesome to see um 
it's great to see how much difference there is and how much confidence there is. And, 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 and they're presented sexily. They're not just like, they're not just different body types. They make all of them beautiful in their own way. And it's great. It's so great. So that's my, that's one of my big critiques is that it's a shame that all of this amazing stuff that I can praise and I love, and I love that it, that it, uh, that these games so confidently portray it visually, but that they're so afraid to say the word gay or to even just be a little more explicit. They will never cross that line, and it sucks because it deserves to go across that line. We deserve some explicitly gay characters in these games. Again, where's our where's our lesbian Zoras? Where's our our gay or our, our gay non-binary Goron love? Where's our, uh, uh, cause Gorons don't even have a gender. They're all just non-binary. It's amazing. They're rock gender. Um, you know, where's our lesbian Gerudos? Where's Bolson's husband? He deserves a loving husband. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you know what else we deserve? We deserve gay bokoblins. I'll tell you, there's a lot of art of gay bokoblins. There's a lot of art of gay moblins and gay bokoblins. Where the hell's our where the hell's our in-game representation? I want to see the little bokoblins snuggling each other and giving each other smooches. Where are they? Give me it. I'm tired of this shit. Tired of the bullshit. Do they have personalities? They, oh, come on. They totally do. You're telling me the boat cobblins? All right. Let's move on. Okay, everybody. I've given my queer analysis and my rant. Okay. Um, I mean, guys, okay, hold on. Uh, small spoiler warning. Okay. Or rather not a small spoiler, spoiler warning. Uh, uh, this is going to be a piece of the of the of the story that I want to I want to comment on specifically. Um so this is a spoiler. Uh I don't I don't know how much of a spoiler it is because you can literally discover this within the first like 5 minutes of the game depending on where you go, but just a warning, if you're super super mad, mute the stream for the next 10 seconds. Okay, here you go. 5 4 3 2 1. Okay, there you go. All right. Uh in this game, uh Zelda uh does a magic ritual and turns herself into an immortal dragon, okay? Now, that in and of itself sounds like a, kind of like a uh, like a like a a bit of a fantasy trope, okay? But l continuing on the theme of the queer analysis, Zelda basically becomes uh, gives up herself and becomes this like giant gender gender as uh, ascendant beyond gender god. And I love the portrayal of, of the dragon because it keeps so much of Zelda's traits, but it is clearly something beyond Zelda. I love that. That is some gender, gender nonsense going on right there. It's also sexy as hell. It's a super cool concept. And it just you know, it doesn't, they don't go anywhere with it. They You get it in a memory and it doesn't go anywhere. And that's frustrating to me. But... The pieces are there. All of the pieces are there of of literally becoming a, 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 a god, of ascending beyond. It's super awesome. And I, I love it. And I love that there's this, um, that there's like all of these themes of becoming, that there's all of these themes of, of, of change. Uh, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool. Um, so I wanted to give some credit there, even though, uh, uh, again, w they don't do anything with it really. Um, may, uh, again, there could be something at the very tail end of the game that I'm missing because obviously I haven't beaten the final boss, which we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a shame that all we get is a, a small snippet of, uh, of that whole thing one of the coolest concepts they put into the game so um
I'm almost done. Well, we'll say. Let's talk about about something else. I want to move on to something else, okay? These are my critiques, my next level of critiques, okay? Uh the story, okay? Uh True, real quick, Marinara says gender upheaval rots away all the gender roles. Exactly. How a princess, the most femme coded princess, ascending to genderless dragon godhood. You're telling me that's not fucking gender thought as fuck? You're telling me that's not queer as hell? That is queer as hell. But, but they just kind of let it, it just is kind of like lightly portrayed. They don't dive into it at all. They don't bite into it. There's so much meat. Next, the story in general. This is one of my biggest critiques of uh, of Tears of the Kingdom. And it's one of the things that I, I if you watch my initial review, uh, my first impressions video, which I posted a little bit ago about Tears of the Kingdom, my first impressions um, were, uh, 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 were basically very positive. And of course, I hadn't done much of the story at that point. Um, I have now since, of course, done almost all of the story. Um, except for the very, very, very tail ends. Uh, the very tail end of the game, I haven't beaten the final boss. Um, and I have to say, I'm pretty disappointed with certain aspects of it. There are pieces of the story that I absolutely love. The aforementioned dragon stuff is amazing. I love that they've added all these new characters. However, I feel the need to point out that despite this game seeming to really want to uh, to put you in the world more, in Breath of the Wild, a lot of the game was focused on the ancient past. You're running through old ruins all by yourself. You're exploring through things like like the lost pieces of a culture that, that no longer exist. And in this game, it really seemed like they wanted to, okay, let's spend time in the Hyrule of the now. You know, the ruins are, you're not spending as much time climbing through Sheikah ruins. You're not, you know, you're not fighting these ancient mysterious robots that are beyond human comprehension. You're not like trying to piece together the mystery of the past as much, except that you do. Um, they use the exact same way of telling the story that they did in Breath of the Wild, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because thematically it doesn't line up. Breath of the Wild, you wake up after a hundred years to a world that has been, that is like completely and utterly, you know, uh, it's diff it's completely different than you remember it. And you're trying to piece together the past that happened when you were there in, in this game, everything happened is, has supposed to be happening in real time. And you, you kind of just pick up these memories across the world that are happening a thousand years ago to characters that you don't interact with. You, you, Mineru got done dirty, okay? Mineru got done dirty. They made a beautiful character who's super, super cool, and you only ever see her in snippets in a memory. You never get to meet the Sonya. You barely get to actually engage with any of the stuff that was written for Ganondorf and Raru. You talk to Raru for a grand total of 20 minutes at the beginning of the game, and then the rest of it is all somebody else's memories. Link doesn't even get to engage with any of that stuff. He's engaging with the world via Princess Zelda's memories again, just like you did in the first game, which made sense in Breath of the Wild because you were trying to piece together what happened while you were in a coma, and that was core to the story game, the, the experience of the game. And this is something that gets really, really weird in Tears of the Kingdom that I didn't understand. At the very beginning of the game, they set up all this stuff about how the world was torn apart by the calamity, you know, and that everybody is trying to rebuild the world since the calamity, right? So one of the first things you will encounter in Tears of the Kingdom is these little stacks of materials. And if you read the sign, it says, you know, uh, under the orders of Princess Zelda, the Hyrule Reconstruction Project has been undertaken which is like, okay, I get it. 
in Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild is about discovering what happened while you were gone, and Tears of the Kingdom is about building the world that's to come. It's about engaging with the people who are there instead of just the past. It's about building things in real time and solving problems in real time. And in fact, in some ways, I kind of got the idea that it was going to be a little bit like, uh, like Majora's Mask which is my favorite Legend of Zelda game to the degree that I have a, literally have a Majora's Mask tattoo. Majora's Mask is a really interesting game. I'm just gonna go on a little tangent here about Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask takes place, the entire game takes place over three and a half days, the whole game. And you have to relive those days like a Groundhog Day style loop um, in order to beat the game and you go back in time and you experience all of these different things that were happening in this incredibly dense world stories that when you first land you had no idea were even happening all of these different people um, all living their lives in these three days and you go and choose to engage with with each and every one of them and help them fix their problems and what it creates is a world with incredible incredible depth and also a world that you touch all throughout your actions as a player your actions as a character as link are in, in, directly engaging with the world in the present in those three days and in breath of the wild it seems like it's going to set that up but then you don't actually do that all that much and in fact the most ridiculous way, the most ridiculous thing about this is that it sets up, you have the ultra hand, the thing that lets you build engineering solutions. You are given at the very beginning of the game, there's going to be materials all over the world to help people rebuild their stuff. There's even a company that is, the, you know, the, the Hudson... Uh, President Hudson Building Company that's all about building people homes for all the people who were displaced after the uh, after the the calamity that happened in the previous game. And then you, the only thing that you really ever build outside of a small quest, which I'm going to talk about, which is one of my favorite quests in the game, is things to hold up advertisements. I'm not kidding you. This is one of the most infuriating aspects of tears of the kingdom is the fact that the um that most of the building puzzles in the game not like not like the little things that you do freeform obviously that's really cool i should be clear i really love the device building like you can build little cars and you can build little ships but that's just for you that's for you to get around the world and de and de to defeat enemies but the actual building that you do with those building materials outside of making yourself little devices to to you know springboard you over a obstacle is helping this random guy that you have no real investment in some kind of obnoxious character who is repeated copy pasted all over the world and he's asking you to to help his sign stand up which is an advertisement for the hudson building company and that's what they came up with all of these themes of rebuilding after uh calamity all of these these themes of like engaging with the world and you, the only way that you get to use your tools to do that is to help prop up advertisement billboards, literally obnoxious billboards for an annoying character who just gives you kind of like low, low level upgrades. It's really unfortunate. They're all really easy too. Um, it's, it's incredibly unfortunate. It's a huge missed opportunity. Um, because when I saw that there was those materials that were going to be all over the world, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be building houses for people. I'm going to be building sheds for people. I'm going to be, uh, you know, helping people. Uh, I, I thought for sure that I was going to go to Hateno village and they were going to be like, oh no, a monster destroyed our windmill. Help us do an engineering puzzle to rebuild the windmill. I thought for sure that that was going to be um what they were gonna do i thought that was that was the direction that they were gonna go with the the building pieces being so big but unfortunately the uh the um the 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 building stuff was mostly focused on building yourself gadgets and i will say i want to be clear again i love that 
Fusing weapons is amazing. It's so cool. It, they literally fixed all of the issues that they had with durability. I love the weapon fusion system. It's really, really cool. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the devices, like the, the flying machines, the, the, the hover bikes, the, the six, the 18 wheelers, the everything that you can build with that, the combat devices, all of that is really cool. And I really, really like it. I actually think that it's like some of my favorite stuff in the game is all of the ridiculous devices you can build. And I've had an incredible amount of fun building silly devices and watching other people build silly devices. Um, I've seen people build snake, snake battle mechs. I've built battle mechs. I think it's really awesome. The engineering stuff is great. The rocket, t the rocketry is great. Building multi-stage um building multi-stage balloon devices that can keep going um the different you know all the different materials you've got the heavy metal you've got the stone in the middle you've got the wood that can catch on fire all that stuff is really great and i really like it i just wish that it tied into the story more i truly wish that like those all of those tools are there for you to take part in rebuilding the world and it just doesn't happen except for one exception which is my favorite side quest in the entire game Luralin village small spoilers here okay um in in Luralin village there is a side quest where um you are supposed to rebuild the village it starts with a little combat quest and then afterwards, you work for the aforementioned flamboyant gay guy who I love to death, Bolson. You work with him in order to rebuild the village. It is a very, very heartwarming quest, and it ends with an incredibly, incredibly adorable ending cinematic that I absolutely adore. Um, it's it's my favorite side quest in the entire game um, is, that, is that side quest. It's really, really good. Um except one thing which is that there's only four buildings to build and all of the buildings are repaired in basically the exact same way um now at the beginning of the quest you were given a challenge to transport a bunch of materials over a long distance that was awesome it was super cool to have to figure out how to transport giant logs to the town but unfortunately after that point you just kind of use the ultra hand to slide a tree into a hole and then it finishes the quest for you automatically after that you don't have to custom build houses you don't have to use special parts even though they have all of the tools there to do that everything you've got so many there's so much that they could do with the ultra hand there's so many things that you glue together and there's a bunch of shrine things where you're asked to make funny little devices but when it comes to engaging with the actual world of hyrule you ultimately just kind of just slot a tree into a hole and that's kind of maybe it's five built buildings and it and it, it it's it's depressing that that's the case. It's one of my biggest criticisms of the game is that there is this amazing building tool, but that it's ultimately mostly only used for combat and for traversing as quickly as possible. Um, the world this game suffers a lot from from open world syndrome. And I will say, even with that in mind, it's one of the better open world games that I've played. But it's so open world that you. Um, that you that, that you don't actually there's not a lot of depth to most of the places that you go and it's really unfortunate because they deserve depth you spend less than you spend like almost no time in kakariko village you do one quest in hateno village you do one quest in luralin village these are the icon iconic areas of the game where all of the characters that you know and love are are living and you spend almost no time in them Instead, you're running all over the map trying to find every single shrine, every single Korok, every single treasure chest. And let me tell you, there is a lot of collectibles in this game, some of which I'm really happy with. I'm really happy that there's a bunch of uh, outfits to collect. I've had an absolute blast collecting and putting together the outfits. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there's so much to collect and there's so many things that you're constantly trying to collect that... Um, that the the depth of each of the locations suffers and i have to say 
this ties into another major critique that I have of this game as a comparison to Breath of the Wild. In Breath of the Wild, one of the things that made Breath of the Wild so magical, and I loved Breath of the Wild, okay? One of the things that made Breath of the Wild so magical was the fact that you had to scrabble all over the world to get around, and you could. There were all kinds of cheesy ways to get around the world. Um, uh, uh, everything from building little, you know, putting together, you know, stacks of, 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 uh, of wood to building to you know knocking down log bridges to climbing up and and hiding under an overlook and building a fire so you can wait out the rain gliding from this place to that place getting a small boost off of a fire there's all of these things and as a result of um as a result of the way that things have changed in tears of the kingdom you actually spend a lot less time actually engaging with the world um there is so much verticality in Tears of the Kingdom, which is cool on one hand. It's really awesome that the game has uh, three layers of world. There's a deep world and a sky world. That's really awesome in concept. But what it actually ends up meaning is that the design of the game is designed around uh, flying all over the place. And the thing about flying is that you fly over almost everything in the game. Here's a great example of this. The difference between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom just going to Goron City. Going to Goron City in Breath of the Wild was uh, a matter of uh, uh, getting attacked by Octoroks and fire-breathing Lizaphos. You, you had to keep finding food that would help you resist the heat. You had to avoid lava pools and climb up hot rocks. You had to scrabble all over the world, jump over big canyons, and you finally found yourself into the Goron Town. And you had you, by then, you had gotten a familiarity with the ground. You want to know how I got to Goron Town in this game? Uh... Uh, I happened to see Goron Town while I was flying from a sky tower and I just floated into Goron Town. You just drop in to almost every location in the game. And and it, it, it incentivizes you to do that. There are these towers all over the place and the game literally tells you, try getting to a high point. And so instead, you... You don't actually walk through any of the world. It went in 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 Breath of the Wild. You came to intimately know all of the zones because you would explore them on foot. You would have to climb around and deal with the elements and the enemies and learn where the camps are and all of this stuff. And you do not have to do that at all. And in fact, you're incentivized not to do that because so much stuff is in the sky and so much stuff is underground. Um so many times in the game it you just fly into a location and you just kind of like go like this it's this vertical experience of going up and then down and picking a location going back up into the sky picking a new location and it means there's all of this beautiful world that they built that you just are not incentivized to go through at all you really have no reason to go through it anymore uh because they changed the design so fundamentally and it kind of sucks And ironically, I find myself going out of my way to walk places. Yes, but but the the problem with that is that you have to go out of your way to do it that way. That's not the way the game even tells you to play. The game puts a high amount of incentive on finding them, on finding the sky towers and then using them. And the game has so much sky material that you're very, very incentivized to jump from those high spots down into places on the earth. And unfortunately, that means that the beautiful Hyrule that they built suffers as a result. Now, what I would have done is I would have had a lot more stuff happen in the sky. Um, a great example of this. Let me give an example from a totally different game. Wind Waker. Wind Waker is a game that happened, that takes place on the high seas. Uh, there's lots of water, empty water and islands, and you're going from place to place. And on the way you encounter other people's boats, you encounter little boat cities, you find a random island along the way. You, even though it takes place in a, in a, uh, uh in a water environment in the open seas, you're not just kind of like, you know, plopping under the water and popping up somewhere else. 
Um, there should have been a lot of, in my opinion, they should have put a bunch of stuff in the sky. If they wanted the game to be so sky focused, well, let's have people with airships and random people floating around with balloons. Let's have most of the game take place in the sky so that you're incentivized to interact with people in the sky. Maybe you can only uh, fly for so long and you need to stop at little people's vessels or balloons along the way where you talk to people that you meet. I don't know. I'm not the one writing the game. I'm just the one who's reacting to the way that the world was very different from Breath of the Wild. In Breath of the Wild, the game wanted you to go and it succeeded. Breath of the Wild sticks in people's memories because it had such a vibrant world that you were, the game invited you to, to, to adventure through it. It wasn't an inefficient path, it was your path. The path was to find your find your own way, climb, climb, sail, uh, uh, glide, you know, but not fly up in the sky and dive down um, or build a flying machine. That's another thing, too. Another part of the game that incentivizes you to do the uh, to, to not be on the ground is the fact that you could build so many flying machines. There's so many flying machines. They're like one of the most exciting things to build in the game. And they, they mean that you blast over the environment really, really fast and you don't actually spend your time exploring it. It's just it's a it's a clash of design decisions. Um, and, and that's not to say that there aren't good things in this. Like the sky islands are very fun and cool. They're a little bit repetitive, um, because of open world type stuff. They're just a tiny bit repetitive, but they're overall really cool. There's a lot of fun puzzles on the sky islands. They have a treacherous feeling cause you can fall off at any moment. Um, but it just kind of, it, th there's less care taken to, to have you engage with the world. And it, and it shows, and, it, and at least from, from my perspective, you feel it very intensely. There's so much to gather and there's so much to, uh, to collect. There's so many collectibles that um, you're really incentivized to take the sky towers up, to look around and pick a thing that you want to go to and land at that thing. Instead of like finding your path to each thing and in discovering things along the way, it's this very, like I said, you go up, you pick one, you go up, you pick one, you go up, you pick one. It's got almost like a, like you're going into a lobby to pick a mission almost. And it's, I don't like that direction. It's a criticism I have for the game. And again, the game does incentivize you to do it that way. Um, with one exception, the depths, the depths force you to, uh, to explore uh, manually and the depths are one of the coolest areas of the game for that reason you have to go carefully throwing light in front of you finding a way to get to get the light in front of you or to build a little ATV that has lights on the front of it so you can find your way through the gloom the depths are one of my favorite parts of the game um, explicitly because you you have to find ex extremely weird ways to get from point A to point B you can't just use a sky tower um, and yes, exactly. The depths force you to engage with combat more critically because you take permanent damage. Exactly. The depths are really, really well done. And I do wish there was a little bit more of the story that took place in the depths. Um, because this game feels torn between all three of its locations. Um, it feels like it wants to spend the most time in Hyrule because there's so many, all of the characters that you love are in Hyrule. There are no characters in the depths at all, none. There's like, maybe there's two at the very beginning of the game and then after that, only there's only Yiga in the, in the depths. There's no character story stuff happens in the depths whatsoever. Everything happens on the surface. And the same thing applies for the sky. There's no characters or, or story stuff in the sky at all, except for ones that are directly tied to two of the quests. Um, um, and that's like basically it, uh, uh, which is unfortunate again. Um, uh, because again, all of the storyline happens in Hyrule. Final, I think this is probably my, my last major criticism of the game. Um, and it's another story criticism, which is four kingdoms are in trouble you need to go and work with the sage of that kingdom to solve the problem. It's literally the exact same format as Breath of the Wild. Literally, they only change the superficial. They, they change the dungeon. The dungeon is different, but the story is exactly the same. 
You go to the king, you go to the Goron city and you solve the Goron problem. You go to the Zora city, you solve the Zora problem. You go to the Rito city, you solve the Rito problem. You go to the Gerudo town and you solve the Gerudo town problem. But unlike in Breath of the Wild, you're less incentivized to like know that region and instead you're more incentivized to just drop in and solve the problem. In fact, Pura Pura like yells at you for not solving it fast enough. And this is part of the thing that got me um that got me a little uh a little bit bummed out. This is why I haven't finished the game yet because I burned out because I was I didn't want to just go do the four the four castles. I wanted to see all the new things this game had to to bring. And so I was doing all this other stuff and I just started getting tired of the gameplay by the time that the time came for me to do the main story. And some of the main story is like laughably baby brained. Like um <laughs> the Zoras got done dirty. The Zoras got done so so dirty. The Zoras are just like, oh, guys, we need to figure out the mystery of the sludge. Where's the sludge coming from? There's literally a tower of sludge just dumping down from the sky. And they're like, where's the sludge? Can you guys run over there and check this thing 30 feet away and then run back and then run and check this other thing 30 feet away and then come back? The Rito zone was great. Um, I find the Goron zone very funny and cute. Um... And, uh, and, but the Gerudo zone is like super, super, super quick, like really quick. Like you're done in the Gerudo desert really fast. And also in the Zora one, you're done really fast. So it felt like a chore. Like they were like, yeah, we got to do all four regions. All right, go to the, Gor go to the Goron town, go to the Gerudo town. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, it was, the Wind Temple was awesome. The Rito one is the coolest one in my opinion. And that's because it had this extremely long, plat, awesome, plat, treacherous tr platforming segment at the beginning. Yeah, the approach to the Wind du Dungeon was awesome. It was super great. And I actually like the boss fights. I think the boss fights are great in this game, which is funny because the boss fights in Breath of the Wild sucked. The, the Calamity X in in breath of the wild was like the worst parts of the game all of the calamity bosses were just so boring the 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 fights be, were way more involved in this game and i liked them a lot more um yeah uh and and oh the design of the lightning temple is cool don't get me wrong i like the design of the lightning temple it's just really fast the the gerudo stuff is over like that do you remember how much time you spent in each of the towns in breath of the wild each of the zones was like was a huge chunk of the game like you were meant to really get to know those areas while you were there and it was shocking how long you spent in each region each region was like a new chapter of the game in this one they felt like a chore you're, you want to go run around and engineer devices and find collectibles and unlock all the cool stuff and, and whatever. Uh, and, and then you got to go and Pura is going to yell at you, go rescue the four cities, go rescue the four cities. And then you get there and they're like, okay, the sledge coming from the sky. Uh, there's a meat problem. Um, there's some zombies. Come on guys. And, uh, it was unfortunate. It was, it was unfortunate that, um, that like, that they basically just literally copy pasted the the story format from Breath of the Breath of the Wild. They should have gone in their own direction. Wh why would you do it the same way? I get wanting to have a part where you help each of the the main races of Hyrule. I totally get that. That's totally cool with me and fine. But um why do it the exact same way? You go to the town, town's having a problem, solve the town's problem, leave. Why? I don't know. It was weak, in my opinion. And it sucked because, again, you are incentivized to go check out all of the other stuff, which you don't hang out in the depths with Sidon. You don't hang out in the depths with your Gerudo friends. You don't hang out in the depths with uh, Tulin or um, what's the Goron guy's name? Uh, Yonobo? You don't, uh, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was a little bit disappointed with the direction that they decided to go with the main story of this game. The main story of this game is the weakest part. 
And to be fair, it was the weakest part of Breath of the Wild as well, but it was way stronger in Breath of the Wild than it is in Tears of the Kingdom, which is a disappointment. And it's unfortunate because it deserved to stand on its own two legs, in my opinion. Um, and uh, there's a lot of repeated content from Breath of the Wild, which is fine. I don't actually mind it all that much. I don't really mind that there's the, the, the cooking system is more or less the same from Breath of the Wild. Uh, I don't really mind that the, like a lot of the plants and animals are the same from Breath of the Wild. Um, I don't even really mind that like the horse capturing stuff is the same from Breath of the Wild, although I wish they would have advanced it more. It would have been really cool if like the, the um, stables expanded so that you could have different animal mounts. Like they let you ride bears and they let you ride mooses and skeletons, but you can't have them as like a permanent pet still. I don't understand that. I do like that your horses carry over from Breath of the Wild. Um, it, it's kind of silly. Um, yeah, you can't ride the, the deer. Uh, I mean, you can't register the deer. You should be able to ride the ostrich birds. Why not? I don't understand why they didn't do that, but whatever. That's a pretty minor gripe. So anyway, these are my main critiques of Breath of the Wild, or of, not of Breath of the Wild, of Tears of the Kingdom. Tears of the Kingdom did a really good job on fixing the mechanical problems of Breath of the Wild. And I like that it tried a bunch of new stuff. I really do. I like that they tried like a three level map uh, or a three tiered map. I think the engineering in Tears of the Kingdom is phenomenal. I think the combat is really fun in Tears of the Kingdom. I love all the devices that you can make. I love the fusion system, system excuse me. I'm happy that they carried over and expanded the cooking system. However, uh, it Tears of the Kingdom failed to, to step beyond Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways that's really unfortunate. The fact that they copied copy-pasted the four dungeons storyline that they literally copy pasted the memory system instead of except this time there's no puzzle element you're not actually like going and trying to find a, a secret picture location to unlock the memory you're just going to a big uh a, a big thing see that's another thing by the way um that's a that's a that's a thing um you know how in uh, Breath of the Wild, the memory system, you had to take a picture with your Sheikah Slate, you had to find a specific kind of hard to find location to unlock the memory? Well, the memories in this game, uh, you are literally told, get to as high of a point as possible so that you can find the location that you need to walk to. They're these giant geoglyphs, they're like paintings on the ground, and there'll be a little drop in them. And you're supposed to get way up. So, of course, the answer is you spend most of the game... This is the main story, by the way. You spend most of the game using sky towers to float around and try and look down and locate where the spot is. Instead of, like, needing to crawl through the world and find the right angle or the cool location using clues from in the world, you're just kind of getting a bird's eye view and slowly drifting back and forth while while nervously watching your uh, your stamina, and uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of unfortunate. It's it's unfortunate that they that they went backwards on that and made it less interesting to engage with. Even though I think the story is a little bit more fun overall. Like um, all the, I I like this I like the story of the struggle with Ganon, whatever, more than I liked the other one. The other one was a little more boring, in my opinion. Um, it's, uh... I really, really have liked Tears of the Kingdom, but unfortunately, there are some decisions that were made in this game's design that I think are truly unfortunate, and I think that as a result, uh, it, it it's too much of an overworld game, and you spend way, way, way too much time basically gathering items that you just gathered in the last game um, in order to burn out before you, before you get to the end of the game. There is so much to collect. There is so much to do. And sometimes it feels like the design of this game is 
more about addicting you to gathering things than it is about actually making you fall in love with the world. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, that is absolutely not true. I have very strong memories of how much I loved crawling through and exploring Breath of the Wild's world. All of the cool locations that there were to find that you would find in the strangest ways. Um, I didn't feel any sort of uh, uh, pressure to, to like, I don't know, it's it's a different vibe. The vibe has changed so much by adding like the sky towers that launch you up in the sky um, and all of the verticality being used basically as a way to skip portions of the world. It's unfortunate. Oh yeah, they got rid of the Hardy Dorian. That is weird. It is kind of weird. At least there were caves to explore this time. Yes and no. There, The caves are uh, slightly better in this game, but there's also a certain laziness in the design. The Ascend tool is cool because it lets the, the world be more 3D, which I like. I like that there's more depth to the world overall. However, it also means that a lot of caves are basically uh, their pits that you drop into. You walk down into the cave, then you drop down into a pit, and then you run around in that pit until you have to ascend back out. There is uh, less attention paid to uh, creating like navigable underground spaces that you can actually remember how to get in and out of, and more of drop into a pit, which you need to ultimately use the ascend tool to get back out of. So there's, there's, a, there's a back and forth there. Some of the verticality is really cool, but it also has led them to over relying on the vertic on the ascend tool. Um, yeah, and did you know that the depths are a copy of the overworld but inverted? I didn't know that. I didn't know it was a perfect copy, but inverted. That's kind of strange. Um, but I, I mean, I think the depths are overall very cool. And I do like that the depths, uh, that relevant locations on the overworld often have something relevant in the underworld as well. I do think that stuff is cool. The, um, the underworld is a really cool area. I just really wish that there was more story stuff to do in the underworld. It's sad. There's no people in the underworld. The underworld is just a playground for combat and engineering solutions. And while there's a lot of fun stuff to be had there, and I do like the fact that you have to navigate it differently, it kind of sucks that you navigate it the way that you navigated Breath of the Wild, but there's nobody there to talk about it. Um, how do your partners feel about this game? Um, well, only one of my partners has actually ended up deciding to like carry through and mostly finish the game all of us have ended up stopping before the end of the game. In fact, every single person that I know IRL has stopped before the end of the game with one exception. And that's, that's Vosh. Vosh is the only person I know who's like totally completed the game. Um, and I don't think Vosh played Breath of the Wild, which kind of makes sense why, you know, he would have the most, uh, patience for the game. Um, yeah. Um, so there's some problems. Uh, there are some issues with, with the fatigue in this game, that you run into a wall of gaming fatigue, it seems, um, before you can enjoy everything that's in it. Oh, uh, I wanted to end this. I don't really have much else to say. Those are my main pretty heavy critiques for the game. Um, to just run back through them real quick, uh, it, it's a beautiful game with awesome character designs, but it's too afraid to say the word gay or show people actually having a husband or anything like that. The storyline is inferior in its delivery to Breath of the Wild um, because it encourages you to engage with the world less and it is a literal copy paste of the exact structure of Breath of the Wild story with just different uh, like actual like content on the inside. Like the, the story itself is different, but the way that you discover the story is almost identical, if not slightly worse. Uh, the, the, the way that you, the fact that they're, the engineering is mostly only used for combat, um, and not as a way to fix problems in the world. You're not using the engineering solutions to fix problems in towns. Instead, the engineering is just a way for you to get across the environment or defeat enemies. 
Um, that's a big problem. And of course, that the, the way that the, the incentive, the way that they incentivize traversal leads to you having a less meaningful emotional connection to the world because you're encouraged to go up into the sky and down to points of interest as opposed to sort of navigating the world on your own two feet with your eyes and choosing interesting paths to get from place to place. Those are my main critiques all summed up. Um, I will say one thing though, which is, God damn, they did a really good job with the new outfits that they put into the game. The uh, Ember set, the Frost dress set, where you have blue painted fingernails and a uh, and a open backed uh, dress, uh, amazing, absolutely incredible. The the uh, fancy hat that you can get that gives Link a bob and blue lipstick is just unbelievably amazing. I absolutely love all of the dress up you can do. I like that there's more options for dyeing your clothes. Um, I like that the, I love the new sets that they added into the game. Even, yes, even the squirrel set. I love the flying squirrel set. It is so cute. It looks so good. Um, I absolutely love uh, all of those uh, uh, outfits. The outfits are, I have no complaints, not a single complaint. They are all wonderful and I love them so much. Uh, and my final conclusion is I really, really like Tears of the Kingdom, but I really don't think it's fair to give this game uh, unalloyed praise, which many people are doing just because they're happy because a new Zelda game is out. I think that it makes some mistakes. I think that it is afraid to go beyond Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways. And I think that it succumbs to, to open world game design in ways that Breath of the Wild did not. Everybody knows, everybody complained about way too many shrines and way too many Koroks in Breath of the Wild. But Breath of the Wild incentivized you to fully explore its world, not just for Koroks, not just for uh, for shrines, but because the world was exciting and interesting and there were things to engage with. There was beauties and secrets to discover. There was unknown things to enjoy around every turn. This game incentivizes you to fly up into the sky and come down on top of something that looks interesting to you, then return back to the sky and do it again. And I don't like that as much. But I do not regret purchasing it, and I do not regret playing it, and I look forward to whatever they decide to do next, and I truly hope that in the next game they'll be brave enough to give Bolson a husband, for God's sake. The man deserves a beautiful husband, okay? Anyway, thank you all very, very, very much for watching and listening to my review of Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, I put a lot of thought into it. I've been thinking on this for quite a while. I've been thinking about my critiques uh, and the things that I loved about the game, and I wanted to spend some time critiquing a game because I really did like this game, and I do think that uh, it deserves more. It deserves it deserved more. And maybe, who knows, maybe in, maybe they're going to do some DLC and it'll add a bunch of stuff that I like. Uh, I, I do wish that the, especially with the engineering stuff, that that would have engaged with the world just a little bit more. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Please make sure that you press subscribe and ring the bell down below. And if you have thoughts that you would like to share, do you disagree with my critiques? Do you have something that I missed? Is there something you really loved or really didn't like about the game? Please tell me in the comments below. I would really love to hear what you have to say uh, because I'm still thinking about this game and I imagine I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time and I would love to hear your thoughts about Tears of the Kingdom. 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 <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for hearing the signal, my lovely, lovely imps.